Thank you so much. I feel like maybe we need to do that primary school thing, like hands in the air and everyone gets beautifully quiet. Does that work? It's all right, won't work. Please keep coming in. It's gonna be that super awkward start to the session. It's always a privilege to be up on Gadigal land um, and we've had some beautiful acknowledgements already today. I also wanted to pay a little bit of tribute. I live and work on Wurundjeri country down in Nam in Melbourne. Um, I live and work really close to Merry Creek, which is a waterway in Melbourne where allegedly John Batman signed a treaty with the local Wurundjeri to cede sovereignty of the land. It's a very hotly contested document. What I find really significant about that is it's a beautiful acknowledgement that very early on in Melbourne's history, the settlers knew full well that the local people had sovereignty and that we know that sovereignty was never ceded. I also want to pay tribute to a really special person. Uncle Jack Charles is a local Boomerang, Jar Jar Wurrung, Yorta Yorta and Woi Wurrung elder in Melbourne, whose life was celebrated yesterday in a state funeral in Melbourne. Uncle Jack Charles was a beautiful storyteller and there's a really important thing that we're doing here and hopefully what we'll be doing in the next hour is telling some stories. Uncle Jack's life was a story of great misery. He was deeply impacted by the state that was imposed upon him. So there's something of a beauty or perhaps irony in the fact that his life was celebrated in a state funeral. But for me, Uncle Jack was a really significant person because I used to ride my bike, I still ride my bike home and at least once a week, he would ride his little electric scooter on the same bike path past me. And for those that know Uncle Jack, he had the most beautiful head of silver hair, huge hair, big hair. And he'd have a little bike helmet jammed onto this hair and his hair would be kind of flowing out beside him. And Uncle Jack had the most beautiful voice. And I'd always just throw out a little, hey, Uncle, on the way past. And you'd always get this lovely reply in, in the most significantly deep, sonorous voice. It was either hello young man or something like that. I can't do it justice. I won't do it justice. Um, but it's deeply sad to lose a storyteller with the power of Uncle Jack. Um, and I know that was really significant for many, pe many people in Melbourne yesterday. But today we are going to tell some stories. This particular room, including those still filtering in up the back, is full of believers. This particular room, I strongly suspect, is full of those who are well on the journey of understanding that the role of business needs to change. Events like this help us really imagine and explain what the next economy might look like. And the next economy is going to look like a lot of people in this room, but at much larger scale. B Corps have been leaders in this space for an awfully long time. We've seen some of the early adopters in the B Corp space really create the very early ideas of what an impact business was all about. And we've seen larger and more complex businesses follow in their footsteps, particularly in the last few years. The thing that they have in common is they all accept a level of accountability in operating a business that in many respects is anathema to what we've come to accept is the status quo in corporations or companies all around the world. The idea that we're actually accountable for our impact and that we shouldn't externalise those negative impacts is unfortunately still a fairly radical proposition. For many, particularly those who are looking to protect the status quo, it's become a really essential ingredient to this magic pudding of capitalism that we rely on globally. And they're deeply challenged when you, when you really confront them with the idea that we have to be accountable for the impact that we have in business. And in this room, we know that that's a fundamental truth to the next economy. The reality is that whilst capitalism needs an awful lot of work, it's the least worst model we've found. It does a pretty good job of driving innovation and allocating scarcity, which is humanity's consistent and great ongoing challenge. The reality is that one of the other models of allocating scarcity is global conflict. And in a weird way, one of the side benefits of modern capitalism is we've created this interdependence, which is a concept that's become so clear in the last couple of years that we are dependent in ways that perhaps we hadn't appreciated before with other countries. The vaccine status of workers in Thailand has a lot to do with our access to flat screens. This interdependence to me is something of a positive fringe benefit to the modern capitalist model. 
It's a really powerful idea and, and perhaps a kind of Adam Smith-backed theory of mutual assured destruction if we don't let markets roam free. But we in this room also know that we can't keep letting markets roam free, that the consequences we're facing are far too significant. One norm within this complex system of capitalism that we need to tackle is the role of the modern company. The 20th century model of capitalism that has driven inequality to staggering levels and has taken us to the brink of the planetary boundaries to support us has also done a lot to lift levels of living standards throughout the world. But the idea that the responsibility of a company is primarily to look after the interests of those who have invested in that country and to simply comply with the minimum laws that a government might try to impose on it is a fallacy that is shown quite clearly every time we see another news story about the consequences of business acting badly. Yet too often we see the story, we think that individual business needs to do better, and then we move on without really asking ourselves what are the elements of the system that needs to change to ensure this doesn't happen again. The thing that excites me is that more businesses at scale around the world are joining this movement in lots of different ways and accepting one fundamental principle, and that is that they need to be accountable in order for us all to sustain our current way of living. We know from B Corps and others that this change to the modern corporation can work. There's much to be explored in terms of public policy in this space, thinking about director's duties, what the modern company should be built on, and I could talk at length about this and excite probably three or four lawyers in the room, so I'm not going to do that. I think there's one other really important element of this, and that's thinking about who are the people doing the work inside businesses who are driving change. And the work that I'm talking about is adaptive work. We need adaptive leadership. Adaptive leadership is very difficult, different to some of the challenges that we often face in businesses, which are very technical. We think about finding solutions to problems. The very nature of an adaptive challenge is that you don't even know clearly what the problem is. Adaptive leadership is inherently conservative. It's about really thinking about what do we conserve as well as what do we innovate. And I think in the progressive world, we have a tendency to jump to the innovation and to believe that the, the power of our ideas alone will convince others. But when you think about some of these challenges, it's just as important to think about what are we conserving, what's good about the current status quo, but most critically, what do we need to lose, and who's suffering that loss? To create change in this space, some people will have to stop doing some things. We will have to stop consuming some things. That's loss. And I think we all need to recognise that those grappling with change inside business are in the are in the business of navigating that very complex space between what's the new stuff that we're excited about, what's the old stuff we need to keep doing, what are we losing and who's losing it. That's complex work. That's adaptive leadership. What excites me about the next hour or so is that we've got three people joining us who are all practitioners of adaptive leadership. They're all doing really difficult and challenging work in different spaces. And they're here today to tell their stories. We're going to have a little bit of a moment for each of them to come up on stage um, and tell a little bit of a personal story, and then we're going to move to a panel. This beautifully small, intimate room is perfectly positioned for all of you to ask deeply personal, confronting questions, sharing your greatest challenges that you hope your boss will never hear about. Please do take advantage of the people that we have on stage and think about what you might want to ask this Brains Trust as particularly they're telling their stories. These sessions always work best when you guys get involved. So I'm gonna start off by inviting Richard Buller to the stage from KPMG. Now, I, I hope that clap was for what you said and not for what's expected from me. <laughs> Richard, expectations are sky. Uh -huh. Um, just before Richard starts, so Richard is the Chief Purpose Officer for KPMG in Australia. Came to KPMG seven years ago after the acquisition of Banara, a human rights and social impact consultancy that he'd founded in 2001. Prior to that, Richard worked on human rights in business at The Body Shop and ran global human rights campaigns against business. 
And I'm hoping that some of you in the room are as intrigued as I am to understand how you go from that to Chief Purpose Officer at one of the world's leading business consultancies and accounting firms that does really significant work with big business all around the world. Mm. Richard, lovely is to talk through particularly that journey from activist to boardroom advisor. Yep. Um, it's not a traditional path to your current role. I suspect there's a few people in the room thinking they might like to emulate that. Um, I'd also like you to, at some stage in the next few minutes to, when you have a title like Chief Purpose Officer, yeah and write an event called Purpose, I'd love to hear your definition of purpose. So I'm going to hand the, hand the dubious microphone system over to you. Well, well, just testing one, two, three. Is that working for everyone? Oh, look at all those thumbs up. Fantastic. All right, Andrew, I'm going to leave you with the mic because I think you'll need that to bring me to a, a rapid close for when my time is up. Um, I've actually pre-prepared, there we go, 10 minutes and, 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 and clicking. Um, I do hope most of you are thinking purpose, KPMG, oh yeah, go on, pull the other one. Um, thank you, there's a, there's a vocal yes down here. Um, and, and I want you to keep holding on to that questioning and that constructive cynicism, because I think that's really important if we are going to be successful in not just charting new ways, which many of you are doing, but taking old ones like KPMG an organisation that's, you know, over 100 years old and looking to re-engineer them, looking to repurpose them, if I can put it that way. So what I want to do is just give you a brief um, story of my background, my backstory, um, my arrival at KPMG, and then what happened seven years ago, I can't believe it's seven years already, um, to where, you know what, I didn't need to worry about it. There's a big digital clock down here, which is also quickly ticking down, much quicker than I expected. Um, and then where I am today is the Chief Purpose Officer of KPMG Australia. Um, I did start life as an anti-corporate campaigner. Uh, I worked for an international human rights organisation in The Hague. Uh, I got to work with, um, and, and since we did a few of those things, is I, I, one of my most extraordinary experiences was working with uh, Ken Sarawira and the Agoni people in the south of Nigeria in terms of supporting them in being heard globally in terms of what Shell was doing and impacting. Now, who remembers Ken Sarawira, Shell? Oh, thank goodness. Some of you are as old as I have, I am, or you've studied it at university or somewhere else. So, um, 1995 was an extraordinarily challenging year for Shell. Brent Spa, they were caught in terms of their environmental behaviour in disposal of an oil storage platform. But what really traumatised that business was being accused in the complicity of the execution of Ken Sarawiwa and eight other Agoni leaders for them speaking out against Shell's environmental and human rights performance in the south of Nigeria. Um, and I had, you know, I had the opportunity as an anti-corporate campaigner um, to, to launch that campaign, um, to work with the Agoni people. And I think for me, when I, when, and, and definition of purpose I struggle with, but in terms of my own purpose, I've always felt a deep sense of responsibility um, to provide platform, to bring those senior decision makers who will impact on the most vulnerable to allow them to hear the most vulnerable people's voices. So that's where I started. That was 1987. That was an experience of being in Tibet, Chinese occupied Tibet, um, and seeing an uprising and experiencing an uprising and having someone next to me actually shot and killed by a Chinese security person and then having a Tibetan come to me and say, please go home and tell your people what's happening to us because I can't leave my own country. I don't have a voice. And that just left me with such a deep sense of responsibility, which I've then honoured, and I have never had an ambition to be a partner at KPMG. I have never wanted to be a partner at one of the big four consulting firms. I never imagined that was a way I would exercise my purpose and bring it to life. But what I did at the end of my human rights career as a anti-corporate activist, I met Anita Roddick. Some of you may remember the body shop. And I found myself then going into four years of working in global public affairs in the body shop. 
a global brand that was absolutely about purpose. Go in and shop, friendly to animals, friendly to people, and it's all about fair trade. And I thought, oh, I'm going to go from an organisation that's deeply political, because I'm sorry you don't get paid a lot in an NGO, particularly a human rights NGO, so it is about your title. It's about the power that you have and things that you can do. And I thought, I'm going to go into a business context. I'm in global public affairs. You know, I report to the head, global head, and he reports to Anita Roddick, the CEO. So I'm going to be able to put forward cases that are rational, that are evidence-based, and the best decision is going to be made. How naive was I? That is not how global corporates work. In fact, my experience as an anti-corporate campaigner suddenly became immensely valuable. And in fact, I was better at running an internal campaign within a corporate than many of my peers and certainly the executives. And it was a moment where I realised, actually, whether it's an NGO, whether it's a corporate, this is a group of people coming together to do something. And generally, when we come together to do things, we spend a lot of time trying to work out how to work together. And therein, I found that opportunity to bring alternative voices, different views, to make better decisions. And that's where I had an extraordinary opportunity and to learn how businesses work and businesses think. And then I left the body shop. And since I left the body shop, I've been working with business. So that's my three parts of my career worked against business, worked in business, and worked with business. I came back to Australia in 2001, founded Banara, a human rights and social impact-focused consultancy. We did our first human rights piece of work with BHP in 2001. Is it really that long ago? Yes, it is. Um, and have had an extraordinary opportunity to work with some of the world's largest businesses in terms of helping them make better decisions around their impacts, their social impacts particularly. In 2015, um, I ran the business really well. Um, we were very exposed to, to gold, which I thought was a great way to hedge. Unfortunately, even gold miners ran out of money in 2013, so I needed to make people redundant in 2014. It's the most awful thing I have ever done in my business career as a business leader is make people that you've connected with emotionally and personally who you have valued is to actually say goodbye to them. Um, and I was on the board of the Global Compact Network Australia. One of the KPMG partners was on there and she said, I love your business, Richard. If you're ever thinking of selling, I can see you're having a difficult time. Come and talk to us. And um, that combined with my oldest son was very, very ill, but I need to make my life simple. So in 2017, sold the business to KPMG. Um, and how did I do my due diligence? I looked at their purposes. I looked at EYs, I looked at Deloitte's, I looked at KPMG's, I looked at PWC's. And the KPMG one, I thought, oh, Inspiring confidence, I was like, yeah, all right. Yeah, auditors, yeah, I guess it's all about confidence, right? Trust, I get it. And then the second part of it was empowering change. And I just thought, actually, I can see myself being part of an organisation that has as its purpose to empower change. I'm not saying that's the only thing I used, but that was a key thing I used. Um, and then we chose, I chose, and I managed to keep most of the people. Two years into being at KPMG, I went to the CEO and, and 12 people came around. So I started, had 20 people, I had to make a range of people redundant, people left. It's funny, once you make people redundant, the really good people are the ones who go next. <laughs> it was a very challenging time. Um, so went to KPMG, um, it was, and there was a moment as well on the, the week of the completion of the deal, my oldest son almost died on the Sunday and we were going to complete on the Friday. KPMG said, oh my goodness me, what's more important than anything else is your family. Please take the time. Let's not go ahead with this. You take the time you need. And I said, no, this is exactly why I'm doing it. Can we please go ahead? And I can tell you, after 12 months of due diligence and negotiations, to sell this tiny little business to this big Goliath, I was done. I just needed to get it done. So did it, completed it. The CEO said to me then, he said, we don't do acquisitions very well. Please come to me, particularly boutiques. Please come to me. Two years in, I was done. 
I went to him with my resignation letter. I said, I cannot make this work. This business does not understand Banara, does not understand what a purpose-led, impact-focused business is about, so we're out of here. He said, oh my God, what do you need, what do you need? And I said, don't put mature metrics on us. My business is all about profit with purpose. This was 16 years after I'd started the business and I'd always said to people who chose to come and work with me, if you want to just focus on impact, please go to an NGO. Please go to a startup. I was a startup, I guess, but I said, what I want us to do is to see our clients value our purpose-driven consultancy, our advice around human rights, how to be more respectful in human rights, how to amplify impact, I want that to be valued in the same way that tax advice is valued, that management consulting advice is valued, because then we know we're increasing the opportunity to truly change that client. So that was what Andrew Yates, he, the, the CEO said, look, I'm about to restructure. Here's your new boss, Andrew Yates. He was the new boss of a, a division. Um, Andrew looked at the business. He said, this is crazy. Let's incubate you. We can incubate you. Let's put different metrics on you. I want you to have impact. Come to me with the accountability about your impact, the change that you're making with our clients. And by the way, see my time is up. By the way, and I'll wrap up quickly. By the way, I want you to do work on my division. This was the audit and assurance division of KPMG. So we took him through a process that was extraordinarily challenging for him and his business by giving voice to those within his business that weren't being heard. Things like empire building. You know, within partnerships, financial metrics are critical. In fact, I would argue too critical. They're not balanced enough. And that results in all sorts of behaviors that then aren't positive, aren't impact focused. Um, Andrew loved it. He said, in a leadership position, in a large organisation like this, there are so few people who are prepared to actually speak up and tell you as it is, and I value that from you, Richard. Then Andrew and I went on a Jarwin executive. We went up to Cape York. He stood there um, in Lockhart River after half a day in Lockhart River. I don't know if anyone's been up to Cape York, and, and, and as high as that, you stand in such a challenged community like Lockhart River. And he said, Richard, I can't believe I've grown, I'm born and bred in Australia, and I had... I did not understand. I said, I knew, I heard, but I did not understand until I sit here in this community and experience, see what they are experiencing and just simple things like having, having medicines. You know, we heard that in terms of the Pacific, that happens here in Australia. People die for want of basic medicines. And then he became the CEO and that's when he rang me up and uh, Andrew became the CEO last year and he rang me up and he said, Richard, I want you to be the Chief Purpose Officer of KPMG. I never knew there was a thing such as title envy until I put that title up on, on, on LinkedIn. And I said, Andrew, you're crazy because if you didn't notice, ESG is taking off and you've got this sustainability, you've got this ESG business and I'm leading that and it's growing really well. Why would you want me to do that? And he said, Richard, I need this business, these 12,000 people to know that I'm serious about this being a purpose-led business. I've been to so many other businesses that say they're purpose-led and it breeds cynicism. And I can't afford that to happen and I don't want that to happen at KPMG. So here's the challenge. How are we going to turn 12,000 people into a purpose-led business in the next five years? Because my challenge to him is, is I won't accept the role unless you commit to embedding this post your term. So he's only got a six year term and he said yes to that. So I look forward to all of your ideas and helping me with that. Back to you, Andrew. I know I went far too long. Thank you, Richard. Part of my job is to lurk uncomfortably on the side. Um, our next speaker, and I'm really thrilled to introduce Nikki, someone who I've been working with in different capacities for the last couple of years and in the world that we live in just met in person for the first time. Um, Nikki's the CEO of Unilever Australia in New Zealand and former CEO of global luxury retailer T2T. She has over 25 years of experience in developing and building brands, growing businesses and transforming infrastructure and culture. I know from very first-hand experience, she's a passionate advocate that businesses today have to drive regenerative agendas that positively impact people, planet and profit. And 
really try and structure themselves as a true force for good. If any of you have seen her on TEDx, she speaks passionately about love as the new corporate currency, and you need to see that to understand it, to drive creativity um, and high performance in business. So, Nikki, you're something of a repeat offender, leading organisations and driving change. Um, would love you to talk about your career and share a little bit about that aspect of your story, because I know it's a really interesting one. Sure. Can I just check? Can everyone hear at the back of the room? Yes? Good. Uh, well, firstly, I'm, um, I feel very privileged to be able to hear, you know, be here with all of you today and to share a little bit of my own story, but also my bigger passion, which is around a coalition of willing and able, but most importantly, passionate and courageous people from all walks of life that can help to address some of the very many wicked problems we face, but also the very many opportunities that come from that when we lean in together. So where to start? I did not grow up wanting to be the CEO of any organisation, um, but there were a few things that certainly were serendipitous in my journey, but probably also very true to my own DNA. And, and these three things were true. The first one was I always loved the world of business. A little bit of that trading dimension was something I was always passionate about. So whether it was the cake store or then the lemonade stand, maybe the t-shirt making, you know, and led to greater things. I always loved the idea of how do you serve people with things that they love. The second thing that was true for me was I, I can, I'm pretty calm most of the time. Not many things faze me but I really don't like injustice. And so this sort of activist in me came out very, very young. I remember telling my parents I was going to stay at a friend's house for the weekend. And um, I would have got away with that, except they saw me on television advocating for Aboriginal land rights and uh, I got caught. So this and, and a passion for the environment is something that always has you know, flowed through my, you know, my, my heart. The third thing that was really true is I grew up in a very multicultural environment. Like I'm the daughter of um, immigrant parents who came to Australia and built their life here. A um, bit of Italian, bit of French, bit of Egyptian. I married a Scotsman. My children hugely confused or delighted about the melting pot that they're in. But what that taught me for was from a really, really young age was the power of harnessing diversity. And we talk about that a lot but actually it's about the inclusiveness and the sense of belonging that you can create when you truly embrace that and then the amazing amount of ideas and perspective and solutions that come from that space. And I guess those three things, creating profitable growth whilst at the same time having a regenerative impact on the planet, not just sustainable, but truly regenerative and simultaneously contributing to a fairer and more socially inclusive world those three things are what have brought me to the career that I've had over time. So I don't know if many of you have felt like this, but I spent certainly the first half of my career thinking, I'm just going to work really, really, really hard and I'm going to get to a point where one day I can leave what I'm doing and then I can go do something that actually matters. So I'm going to go and then make a difference. I'll go and work for an NGO or I'll go start something where I can serve the community. And, and actually maybe having kids and just the reflection that comes with that I thought that was kind of crazy. Like I spend a lot of time at work, more than I spend with family and friends. I want to get up every day and be able to feel like the time I spend is making a difference. So that's when I started to really seek out organisations very deliberately that would enable me to do two things. One, can I create the impact that I want? Even if it's just small, but that small ripple effect can be quite powerful if you can inspire others to do the same. But the second thing was, can I show up in an organisation that's actually going to allow me to do it? And they can be two very different things. You can be really clear about what your purpose is. You want to make sure you're showing up every day somewhere in a tribe that's going to allow you to make that happen. And Unilever for me was that. I've been at Unilever for 17 years now, but in many different roles in Australia and New Zealand, but also abroad. And that's afforded me an opportunity to do some remarkable things because Unilever 120 years ago was born out of purpose. You know, Lord Lever really wanted to make sustainable living commonplace in Victorian England and just make sure that people had a bar of soap, not just the elite, but everybody, so that you could manage hygiene and therefore mitigate some of the problems that were living there at that point in time. 
Um, the role prior to this, I took on the role of global CEO for T2T. And when I took on that job, that was a business that wasn't born out of purpose, but was certainly born out of passion. And I kind of thought, what if we could harness all of the passion in this organisation and become a B Corporation? And I remember when I first raised it with the team, they were like, she's joking, right? So we're not, like, we're not seriously doing this. Not because the intention wasn't there, or the interest, or even the passion, but because we didn't know what we were doing. How are we going to get there? And so often that stops us. Um, but after sort of three and a half, or three years or so, we did become B Corp certified globally for T2T. And then when I had the really good fortune of coming back to Australia with my family after being abroad for quite a long time to take on the role as CEO for Unilever Australia and New Zealand, I kind of wondered, well, what if we could do it again? but do it with a bigger organisation that has so much more reach. You know, we reach about 15 million people every single day with our products. And for those of you that don't know what Unilever is, we're a fast moving consumer goods company and make products from home care and personal care, hair care, skin care, ice cream, beverages, foods. Like we have an opportunity to make a small difference every day in the way we show up. And I was really lucky to be surrounded by an amazing group of people who said, hell yeah, we want to be on that journey in the middle of COVID, dealing with all of the supply discontinuities that came with that, but this North Star of I want to be a business that can make a dollar and make a difference was hugely compelling. And in August of 2022, in partnership with um, Andrew and B-Lab and the whole B Corp community, Unilever Australia and New Zealand, a big business, became a B Corp. And that was a huge milestone for us. And yet we're just scratching the surface of what we need to do. So at the end of the day, I'm a really big believer that you do need a lot of different people to help make change and progress in this area. And so I sit on the board of the World Wildlife Foundation for Australia um, because I want to make sure that I'm continuously being curious and upskilling myself in the area of the environment. And I also sit on the board of Global Sisters, which is a social enterprise to lift women that are uh, financially vulnerable into situations where they can support themselves and their families and their community, and I do that to keep me honest when it comes to how we serve society. And that allows me to practise my own purpose around wanting to smash through glass ceilings, but more importantly, using business and its scale as a force for good and having a true triple bottom line impact, profit, people and planet. So with that, I'm happy to take any ideas that you have for how we can do it better and any questions that you might have with me that can perhaps help you on your own purpose-led journey. But I look forward to, to catching up with you today. Thanks, Vicky. Thanks so much, Nikki. And for those of you who work in B Corps, there was a whole layer of complexity and additional requirements that comes for a business like Unilever Australia and New Zealand navigating B Corp certification. And one of the things that really blew me away was the amount of work that Nikki and her team had to do internally and in a global business to build a case for something that is a pretty radical act inside a global multinational business like that, where there is huge values alignment, but there is an incredibly complex system to navigate. And I think Nikki would probably agree, we don't make it easy. A perfect segue as well to think about people working inside businesses um, is to introduce Anne Astra Sobi. Anne spent the first half of her career trying to drive systems change across the public and private sector to tackle social and environmental challenges at a systems level and the latter half learning how to harness the power of technology and business to make impact at speed and scale. In her work, she's been looking to innovate and build new technology, but also crucially build a case for change inside very complex businesses across Asia Pacific and Japan. Um, and I'd love you to tell us your story. I think you've worked in some amazing organisations and so much of this has been about driving change. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about this later. But when Nikki speaks about the team of people who you need to have around you to do this work, I think your um, career is, is one of really someone who's been at the coalface of this for a very long time. So let's hear from you. Hello, everyone. Mike's working in the back. All right. Thank you for that kind an uh, intro, Andrew. And my gosh, look at this panel. I'm honored to be a part of the crew. So myself, the reason for these notes, 
I was at Purpose four years ago on stage and the composition of the room has changed a little bit. And after my own journeys, I took a serious thought about what information, what insights I could share that would be the most useful for all of you. And so my goal is to tell you my own story that forms my perspective of how to make change and some of the aha moments along the way. I think in this context, it's especially useful, as Andrew mentioned, there is no well-paved path, as all of you know, to being a change maker. And so we all learn all these skills and take what we know to try to affect change in the way that we know how. My story, I'll start from the beginning. From childhood, my family came from humble beginnings. We grew up in government welfare housing. I know the feeling of desperation. If you think, if someone just gave me a little bit of help, I'll work really hard and I will contribute in amazing ways. So, at the same time, I was also an idealist from youth. I kind of didn't have a choice but to believe that anything was possible unless proven otherwise. And so my main purpose was to spend my life creating an equal playing field for all humans to thrive, regardless of where and to whom they were born. And in order for humans to thrive, we obviously need our natural environment too as well. And so my stepmother reminded me just the other day that at an early age, 11, I was taking my glitter signs and already being a self-proclaimed political campaigner, advocating for the parties that were trying to serve those that were underserved. And so that was just the beginning, that tenacity was never tempered. And for me, by the time I got to university, I had to think about what are the things I need to know to change the fate of a society. And so I double bachelored in business and law while indulging in lots of peace and conflict studies and computer science courses. When I started my career, my goal was to understand how to alleviate social and environmental challenges at a systems level, starting by consulting for Fortune 500s and large NGOs on their organizational strategies and programs for enabling change. Back then, the term environmental social and governance or ESG didn't exist. There was a lot of focus on CSR via community engagements, and focus only on green organizations, largely with altruistic founders or those that were already under regulation by the likes of the Environmental Protection Agency. After working across government and the nonprofit sectors, I realized that some of the places in the world with the most extreme poverty were still being undersupported by both groups. And this compelled me to start my first nonprofit, which aimed to bring skilled volunteers from around the world to communities with dense populations of extreme poverty that were not being served and working with them to co-build infrastructure, skills, and capabilities for those communities based on what they felt they needed most. The first major aha moment, and I would love to know if you agree or not, let's talk about it once we hit the panel. Despite the passion from a lot of purpose-driven individuals, people, programs, policies, partnerships alone couldn't reach the billions of people I aspire to in my lifetime. So I revived my love for computer science to evaluate how technology could help. My awe and love for the power of technology started with my father. He was a nuclear physicist turned computer programmer and whom I would sit with as he learned various program languages from our extensive bookshelf over the course of my childhood. And I would watch him code line by line each night and this code would eventually turn into one of the world's first mobile banking experiences. So simultaneously, while we made everyone's life more convenient, hopefully, it also lifted our family out of poverty. So I asked myself, why isn't the for-purpose sector using more technology to tackle some of these hairy, complex challenges? One of the major challenges we found was the scarcity of technical talent around the world, which still exists, and the inability for nonprofits like myself to compete with the remuneration packages that these software engineers were getting from the bigger companies. And so I took it upon myself. Let me go learn that secret sauce of how to go from idea to hyperscale to future-proofed innovation and bring it back to the for-purpose sector. So I spent eight years at Google trying to learn the secret sauce in, in a way that I only saw Google did back then. They were, they were also, and I believe still is, the world's largest cor uh, corporate philanthropist, one of the co-godfathers of the 111 philanthropy model. There I built, sold, and commercialized enterprise marketing, analytics, and big data technology, managed their strategic philanthropy portfolio across North America and APJ, or Asia Pacific and Japan, supported greenifying their own data centers, as well as various diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. 
I also led our Google Impact Challenge in Australia, where we would grant a quarter of a million to a million dollars to for-purpose organizations, nonprofits, educational institutions, social enterprises, who had an idea for how to use technology to solve a social challenge and would help them bring it to life. After all this, the second aha moment was similar to what Richard and Nicole mentioned, to be an effective altruist. I would commit to making career decisions based on where someone with my unique skill sets and perspective can make the most impact. So after Google had matured and established an army across all ESG matters, I thought my job was done. Someone else can keep doing what they're doing. I left to start my second nonprofit, a social enterprise and ethical jewelry business called Generous Jewels, which is still up and running. The third aha moment in creating Generous Jewels was that there wasn't enough of the world's resources being committed to tackling these social and environmental challenges and new business models needed to be tested and formed. Realizing that the entire for-purpose sector at the time would need to be 63 times its size just to provide basic health care to people in poverty around the world. So the goal of Generous Jewels, first, to provide an ethical option in the jewelry industry, Two, to provide employment in parts of the world with less economic opportunity, especially for women. Three, redirect the profits or funds that would have gone to the private sector instead to effective nonprofits and research groups working to alleviate poverty around the world. And four, empowering our customers to take action by choosing which nonprofit they wanted 100% of the profits from their order to go to. After launching Generous Jewels, I reconnected with the co-panelists from Purpose 2018 who is an internal change maker at a company called Zero, pushing the company to think more about how it could give back as the company was growing and starting to pierce the ASX 200 top companies list. For those unfamiliar with Zero, they're a small business software company with three million and growing SMB customers around the world. And in 2021 was one of only two software tech companies on Australian stock exchange top 20 companies list. I joined them in February of 2019 to develop and pitch a holistic sustainability vision across environmental, social, and governance, and company-wide strategy custom fit to them, to their board and C-suite, with the goal of getting buy-in to start building this practice from the ground up. We created a layer across every part of the company to identify effective ways to do good and evolve the way that we did business. On the environmental side, thanks to my small but mighty team at the time, in just four months, we became carbon neutral. We went on to become one of the first software businesses to become climate active certified by Australian government. We reduced emissions by 40 to 60 percent across various emissions sources across scopes. We developed sustainability tech innovations for our small business customers to use. And we were working towards our own SBTI aligned targets into the future. So now I'm hoping to help other Asia Pacific Japan businesses, all of you, with their own sustainability tech innovations. If there's a big, hairy challenge that you really want to solve right now, but you know that it's not possible with technology, I'm here to help come up with those ideas and bring it to life. With that, I'm looking forward to seeing what all of you do. It's a rare experience to have so many passionate change makers in the room, so it's an honor to be joined by all of you. That's it for me, Andrew. Come and grab a spot. Um, Hands up the underachievers in the room. My well-founded imposter syndrome just really <laughs> got a lot worse. Um, I'm going to come sit on the couch. This is weird standing up here. I don't like the podium. So we are now going to move to um, the, the opportunity that you have to ask some questions of, as I said, and I hope, as you've discovered, three pretty amazing people. Um, I, of course, have some questions. I've done my homework. So I know this is a little awkward. We will have a roving um, handheld. Um, so stand up, be proud if you want to ask a question. I promise I'll call on you. I'm going to give you a little moment to think. Um, and I'm going to start off with you, Nikki. Um, there's a lot to talk about when you're reshaping a business as large, as large and complex as Unilever. Um, and I talked a little bit before about the idea of adaptive challenges where the problem that you're tackling is sometimes not even clear. And then you overlay two and a half years of really challenging um, personal impact. How do you draw the distinction between leading and managing a team in this environment? What does good management look like when you're also trying to show up as a leader? I suspect there's a lot of people in the room who are facing that challenge. 
you, you know, I think this, the thing here is I, I didn't have the answers, right? So I could inspire this idea of how can we definitively demonstrate that business can be a force for good by not apologising for driving profitable growth, because that's the role of business, and actually it fuels the investment in the stuff that you want to do on the environment and the stuff that you want to do to better society. So you need all three to happen. But the reality is when we said, oh, let's become B Corp certified and reimagine our end-to-end -end value chain and the challenges and the changes that would need to come with that, the answers weren't going to come from me or, frankly, from the C-suite. We needed that combination of expertise but also beginner's mindset, sort of unconstrained, imaginative, creative thinking. And so to answer your question specifically about adaptive leadership, it was about finding the change agents in the organisation, of which there were many. And, in, and to be honest, we weren't putting together a team of people to do this separately. We were asking people to do this on top of their day jobs. This was about tapping into discretionary effort that just comes from wanting to be part of something bigger than just what you're working on day to day. And so we found just leveraging, if I want to put a label on it, leveraging distributed leadership. The people that had the best solutions were the ones that were closest to the front lines. So we just brought together, we, we, we found opportunities to bring the right people together to unlock the problems and to come up with solutions. And we gave people space to experiment. And many times we got it right and many times we failed. And so the other job that I could do was create an environment where it was okay to get it wrong and to learn from that, pick ourselves up and get on with it again. Um, that's it. I don't think there's a silver bullet. I think it is about creating the right culture to say this is something worth doing. We're all in, giving it a go. We're going to experiment and learn and we're going to be generous with what we find so that Unilever doesn't just become better but we have an opportunity to raise the floor and lift the ceiling in the industry. Yep. That, that helped enormously as a North Star. Yep, and I think that idea of distributed leadership sounds beautiful sounds sensible, but is so hard to do in many organisations where the culture can sometimes really inhibit that kind of behaviour. Um, I'm going to move... Except, except maybe in a partnership because it's an unusual construct because we've got 700 business owners yeah. who are leading 700 different practices and our challenge is the, the opposite, is how do we actually get them to engage with purpose yeah. as actually a way of growing and revitalising, re-energising the business? Yeah. So it's a... Cause Oh, but this is how I was, you know, I've been here for 20 years, 30 years, but this is what I was taught to do. And what we're trying to do is disrupt that thinking mm. by using purpose and go, actually, the world out there is changing and look at the opportunities. I mean, I'm just looking at you, Anne. I mean, you know, you've gone and realised so many of those opportunities mm. and that's what we're trying to, re I guess, in a sense, use purpose just to, to disrupt. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like, I think knowledge can be a dangerous thing in this space, actually. Because sometimes the way you've always done things yeah. becomes the way you think you need to do it and you almost you need to disrupt that thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Mm, I'm not sure I would recommend the partnership model at scale as a, <laughs> as a good business model for anyone to try and navigate. But um, imagine when we're successful. Oh, <laughs> I look forward to that day. Um, Richard, I will come to you um, because you, 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 you occupy a, a fairly significant role in terms of advising other companies, particularly at the board and leadership level. Um, and I want to, here's one for the lawyers out there. I want to talk a little bit about the legal environment and how it serves to really limit mm. thinking and leadership in business. We're seeing a lot of changing in the reporting space. If anyone's in the finance sector, um, you, you would be well familiar with the idea that we're having to report on so much more. The compliance function within large businesses is getting bigger. Mm. And I think that what we sometimes see when we're talking to big business is that they sometimes see something like a B Corp certification as more compliance. Why would we do that? Mm. And when you come across a board that is a little bit in that mindset of we're doing what's necessary, um, we're reporting, we're doing the right thing, um, and we've got a nice strategy statement, but you know they're, they're not sold. They're not sold about the idea of being truly accountable. What sort of conversation do you have with a board like that? Oh, scare the shit out of them. <laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> to paint a future that is challenging 
Um, and their role is to lead the organisation, particularly from a strategic point of view. So I think risk is the first thing that you do, or the first thing that I do. Um, and the current context has got so many questions, right? I mean, I can remember when we sat down with the executive as, as KPMG, um, you know, two months after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you know, we were saying, well, what does this mean for the global economy? You know, and all the models that we looked at then have all been redone because it's actually turned out very differently than everyone was expecting. Well, certainly those who were then predicting the future then. I think that level of uncertainty is what you need to bring in and what I do bring in to those conversations. But then you paint different scenarios. What if? What if this happens? What does that mean for the business that you're leading? Um, then it's the opportunity, right? It's saying... And you can actually take that challenging future and turn it into an opportunity for your business. You know, and I think that's where, you know, if I think about the body shop and what it did, it was well before its time. If I think about Ben and Jerry's and what it did, you know, they were businesses that saw what was coming, saw the challenges that were coming, and actually, you know, the sustainability challenges that were coming totally turned them into opportunities, right? And Unilever with, you know, under Paul's leadership, that was exactly what he did, you know? whether it was Maggi noodles in India or you know, bringing in micronutrients into that. And I, and I think that is the type of thinking that good directors then hook onto is, oh my goodness me, I do need to go in a different direction for two reasons. One is makes good sense in terms of managing risk and trying to be resilient and ready for what may come. And the other, actually, it makes great business sense in terms of opportunity. Scare them shitless, love yeah. it. <laughs> um, I think there's some really important follow-ons from that, but I'm conscious we've got a question from the audience. So well done you. Um, the microphone is, I think, with you. If you could just yep. maybe give us a name, um, that will just make it feel like it's super intimate. Okay. Um, hello, terrific to be here. My name's Ivan Schwartz, and I'm with a company called Points for Purpose. My question is largely directed at Richard, but perhaps for the panel, bit of a loaded gun question. But given that there's over 500 people at this particular conference, I would imagine that there are over 500 causes, uh, worthy causes that people are supporting. How do you uh, recognize personal choice um, in a world of so many choices and options? Mm. Can, can I just reframe and make sure I've got that question right? Is um, all of the variety here, um, everyone has a choice in terms of what they might support in causes. I guess I just wanted to bring that back to KPMG and then asking that question at KPMG, how do you bring purpose to life when you choose to work at KPMG? Um, and, and I guess the, the way I'm going to answer that is it's an invitation you know, I've had to recognise with a workforce of 12,000 people, is there some people who choose to come to work, clock the ticket, they're looking for a paycheck to pay the mortgage and then go home. They actually don't want to come to work um, and find meaning from work. Yeah, it's a means to another end in terms of meaning that they might find elsewhere. And I guess I just wanted to sort of respond to your question in that way is you must be respectful of people's choice and certainly as an organisation, but what you can do is just invite people to explore that and make it easy for them when they do make that connection, right? Support them, enable them. To your point, right, Nikki, is actually back them because it isn't always going to work. And certainly for KPMG in bringing purpose to life, I mean, we've got extraordinary practices like our health, ageing and human services, you know, that are currently working on scale. You know, that's the exciting thing about yeah. a big organisation is when you get that alignment, you know, you change homelessness, not just for everyone in Victoria, but for Indigenous people. Sorry, it was Indigenous people to start with. And the models and the learning and the insights that were able to be provided have ended up changing homelessness services across Victoria. Um, and, and I got loads of examples of that. And to me, that's where the real impact can come from is when you start getting those choices around. Now, who are we going to work with? But most importantly, as a consultancy, what type of work will we do with them? Do you know what we found as well at Unilever on that? You, you can, there's many things you can do, but there's only a few things you, sh you should do at any point in time. And 
we really doubled down our efforts on where we could have the most impact with the most credibility mm. because what we didn't want to do is sort of jump into things that could be better done by others, but we did want to clean up our own backyard. So we believe that there's a role for plastic, but not in the environment. Now, we use a lot of plastic in our provision of, you know, products to people. So that became a real battleground for us. Let's remove, reduce, reimagine, um, because that is, that is something we need to hold ourselves accountable for. And at the same time, it's like a game of whack-a-mole. You sort of fix the plastic problem, but then you've got like waste. Food waste goes up because now you're not using plastics, right? So you have to look at it from a real systems point of view and, and then that helps you make few things done well, get them done, and then move on to the next thing. So I, I just think, honestly, you can't do everything, but you want to do a few things right. And I think we definitely see the best... The, the model in the B Corp world is to use your stakeholders to guide you as to which issues are primary in those audiences that are closest to you. It is a, a truism that there's a great challenge for modern business leaders is that you're expected to have an opinion on everything now, and that's really difficult. But it's also okay to say, we're not ready to express an opinion on that, but this is how we might engage in developing one. And I suspect that there's lots of businesses in the room right now thinking about something like the upcoming campaign on The Voice. Hmm. That may not be a natural space for business, but it's going to be a space for all of you one way or another to think about. And there's a really great opportunity in that, but you need to be guided by your stakeholders as to either what position you might take or how you might engage with something that might be a very new issue to your business. Ivan, thanks for your question. I think we've got another one right down the front. Hey everyone, Andrew from Social Traders. Quick question, what role do you think social procurement can play in helping corporates to embed this idea of purpose? Right sure, first. I'm happy to take a step. Uh, as you guys know, for companies of a certain size, the United Kingdom was the first country in the world to enact what is known as the Modern Slavery Act. And this looks after not just the people impacts and supply chain, but the holistic sort of environmental and social aspects of it. So when it came to Australia uh, a few years ago, obviously Zero is one of the companies that had to adhere to this, but there were already discussions about what we needed to do and what we wanted to do, but there are certain things that we knew our suppliers needed in order to give us what we were asking for, and there are ways that we could help them get to where we both wanted to be. So I think with social procurement, there's obviously the opportunity off the bat to, for example, use the social traders directory to find socially environmentally responsible businesses to source goods and services from. But if you look at large corporations, their supply chains are very complex. They're made from startups all the way through to big enterprises. And so the engagements and the potential partnerships with those suppliers will look very different. I think back to you know, the company strategy, what is the company's point of view on where they can uniquely make the most change? And one avenue for making that impact is through procurement, another is through technology, another is through community engagement, you know, government partnerships, you name it, to affect that systems change. But I think it starts with the clarity of what is that company uniquely positioned to do and how can its partners across the value chain, whether it's suppliers or customers or reseller partners or partners of different types, how can they all engage and work towards a similar direction? So I've seen a lot of corporations have partnership kind of partners to talk to suppliers to help them improve their own practices, but we know, you know, the smaller the organization, sometimes the harder it is to make change overnight just based on, you know, basic financials. And then for larger corporations, it's also hard for them to make change overnight because the number of contingencies when making any one decision is really complex. Uh, so that's not a very straightforward answer, but I guess, you know, start by being clear about what you want to do in terms of impact and then figure out how you can get as many people involved, whether it's your suppliers or your employees to get there. But I think it's very confusing when you just generally tell people, hey, we're looking for a socially environmentally conscious organization. I don't think that's clear enough. I think that one also starts from a position of recognizing that as a business, the companies from whom you procure and what you procure is part of your impact. That's one of the challenges of, a, of, of lots of certification models is they start with the idea, you know, the orthodoxy of great business, even just five years ago, was super long supply chain strapped together with really tight contracts that generally didn't ask any of the uncomfortable questions. Um, and that orthodoxy has changed fundamentally as a result of the pandemic, where shorter sl supply chains have become better business and different as attitudes to risk have driven change. So sometimes change comes from funny places. But I'm really excited by that because I think something like social procurement starts with accepting that 
when we procure, we're having impact somewhere, and how can we reduce that or have a positive impact? It's a great so, so my quick answer to that one is it's huge. And yesterday, after six months of working on the Australian Partners Conference, right, which is 700 of these partners coming together on the Gold Coast, it's like we, you know, all of the suppliers of the coffee carts, right? Because to give coffee to that many partners, you need six carts. But we've told them, no, you're not using your coffee beans, you're using these beans from an Indigenous supplier. But I've got to tell you, the value of time to make that decision happen is much greater than the money we're spending, and that's what needs to change. Mm. Yeah? Yeah, because that's just too hard. To your point, our businesses are too complex, too difficult to do really purposeful decisions like that. Yeah. Shouldn't be hard. I'm right. glad there's um, a chorus of recognition down the left here on that one. These questions are coming thick and fast. Loving it. Hi, I'm Renee Farrow with uh, Rewonder CoLab, and this question is directed mostly at Nicole, but I think relevant for everyone. Um, you started your talk earlier saying that Unilever are trying to be a regenerative business, but decreasing consumption and shifting away from traditional paradigms of growth, like continuous and exponential growth, are critical elements of that, but Unilever are very much built on consumption and continuous growth. So how are you shifting away from that and fundamentally changing the way you do business and therefore helping the world to decrease our consumption? Yeah, look, that's a really, this is like reimagining capitalism, isn't it? Great question. You know, we, we, we start by like looking at every part of our value chain, our brand, and where can we redesign for change, right? Because actually we, we, we can reduce the amount of um, plastics that we put in the environment so that people don't need to, well, we can concentrate our products so people don't need to use as much. We can um, suggest that people use other products. So in our home care business, we've got sprays now, so you don't need to wash your clothes every day or every second day, but you actually use scents that help you to take odours out of clothes. We can work with... Um, on our net zero program, so how do we reduce the amount of emissions that we're putting out there by reducing, uh, using renewable electricity across our operations, but actually recognising that the biggest amount of emissions in our consumer value chain actually comes from consumer use. So educating people on how to do things differently. Don't use shampoo, use dry shampoo. Um, so that you're using less water. So this is, it, it's a partnership, right? We can do everything that we can from the design of our products and our brands, but with every single partner in that value chain, including consumers, we need to work on that behaviour change. And that for sure is the biggest single opportunity and challenge that we have. And kind of welcome any radical ideas that you have in that space, um, because it is going to take a, a sort of a world of, of really creative ideas to crack it. But our commitment is to continuously reimagine and do things differently. And you know what? I think it's so easy to vilify business and big business in particular. And yet what we need is great partnerships so that big business can actually make the big changes that have the ripple effect that truly impact the world. So that's my invitation to any of you that see opportunities for how we can do it better partner with us to make that a reality because we have the scale to actually impact the change. And, and can I add that accountability point is really important and hold us to account. Yeah, I mean, a chief purpose officer at KPMG, you know, that's how I started. And I think that accountability question helps me, right? So and what I'd also do is just draw what Simon was saying around hope that these, you know, we are sitting in organisations that are absolutely, you know, KPMG is a child of capital markets. Capital markets is founded on growth. But what has happened since February is fundamental. We have seen mechanisms of that capital markets used for social outcomes in the Ukraine and Russia. If you'd have asked people, and, and I have, I've talked to those people in capital markets around the types of mechanisms like SWIFT, that have been deployed for a social outcome, that is peace, that is regime change in Russia, they would have said 12 months ago, never will the types of decisions that have just been made. And that's where I just want to acknowledge Eva Cox. Some of you may have heard Eva Cox talk. She's always said, do we want to live in an economy that's supported by society or do we want to live in a society that's supported by an economy? After that, hour of presentation with the board and the executive, I had said nothing for a whole hour and the CEO turned to me and he said, Richard, you've been quiet. 
what's your view of what's happening? And I got to say exactly what I've just said to you, to that board and that executive of KPMG Australia, and you could have heard a pin drop after that. Something is happening. And I think that's where collaborate with us, where you're comfortable doing so, but then hold us to account and challenge us because it's important we get this right. I think there's some really important concepts there too around equitable growth and recognising that we can't ask the yep. developing world to make the tougher choices as they grow their societies and look to lift their living standards. Yeah. Um, so some of those changes in consumer behaviours need to come from the developed economies, which, which is a nuance to the idea of growth, right? Growth has lifted lots of people's living standards, but we need to think about how that works in a complex, globally interconnected economy. Do we have another question? I'm loving these questions. Hands up everywhere, but I'm, I'm in the hands of the mic. Uh, hi there, I'm Sam from Future Super. Um, my question is mostly for Nicole, but for any of you, I'm sure that have um, a perspective on this. As you know, a company that's got a global parent that has a board that's listed, and particularly in light of sort of the supplier crunch and general, you know, expense raises over the last couple of years, how do you go about sticking to purpose and making sure that that stays at the forefront while there's such pressure to deliver profit, particularly, you know, with quarterly reporting and whatnot? Yeah, and it's, and it's a really real challenge, right? How do you um, have... It comes back to conviction, right? At the end of the day, you have to have the conviction that says we're going to navigate these choppy waters because it's too easy for a global pandemic to become the excuse that you don't drive equity in your organisation or that you don't focus on environmental impact. Um, what I've really loved being in Unilever, and you, you can see it in the press, right, so I'm not telling you anything that you can't see yourself, there's been quite some pressure from agitators or activist investors around just double down on driving your financial outcomes and your share um, and, and let's worry about that other stuff in another time. And, and I've loved being part of an organisation that says we have always said we will deliver uh, purpose as well as financial outcomes in equal measure and we will narrow, you know, we will weather that conviction. I think conviction is really, really possible, possible and required. The other thing I think we have to get our head around is just because you're purpose-led doesn't mean you're profit-deprived, right? We have this very unhealthy attitude at times to making money and also being purposeful. What we need to embrace is the and-and. It is absolutely possible to be both and do both well. And when you do both well, then you do reimagine a new form of capitalism that is eminently more equitable, sustainable, and even regenerative. So I think, again, I don't think there's a silver bullet. I think you've just got to go, this is, it matters to our organisation because it matters to the people we serve and that will be our compass. Um, but you need to deliver performance. You know, you, you mm. can't, you can't, you have to do the end end. Yeah. I think, I think uh, um, to add on to what Nikki said, you know, this idea that people think of profitability impact as more dueling business priority siblings I don't know if I buy that so much anymore. Um, I think of them now more as trying to create, you know, doing the hard and the creative work of building a good marriage, right? These companies, they need certain things outside of money to grow. It's great talent, it's great reputations, it's the support of government, other entities to just add value to society beyond what they can do alone. And so there's a lot of things that companies need themselves to grow. And I think those that wait for a compliance or regulatory stick to force them to do the right thing are already missing the point. Just like digital transformation was the big business transformation trend, let's say 15, 20 years ago, sustainability, I truly believe, is the next opportunity for business transformation. And those business leaders that are the most forward-looking are getting creative about how do I do this in a way that helps me grow my business and uniquely takes everything that I have as a company to make impact in a way that no one else can. And if you can find those ideas, you can get the business value while being really clear about the impact that you can deliver. And as the business grows, the amount of resourcing they have to do good grows. And the more good they do, as in not generic programs that their peers are doing, but real calculated impact that they can deliver, the more authentic and compelling that story is. So you don't need a good PR team if you've got a good story that makes sense, right? People People will believe that you are doing the right thing because you've really thought about it. And so I think it isn't a, 
a mutually exclusive relationship. It just takes a lot of creativity and willing stakeholders to help you brainstorm and find those opportunities. And I think those um, you know, companies that do think of ESG as a checklist or compliance exercise aren't spending the time doing the fun stuff, which is what can we uniquely do that we know will be good for the business and good for the world, that we have so many ideas and we really put numbers behind them and we're convinced that this is gonna change the world and change the way that we do business and everyone wins. So I think it's creativity that's lacking. The cynicism doesn't help, um, but I know that you know, previous to being on the corporate side, I always thought, oh, maybe we'll just vilify those business leaders or the companies who aren't doing something. What's true is everyone is a human. They have passions and children and personal experiences, but the immense pressure on CEOs and boards to make the right trade-offs for the business of the right time cannot be underestimated. So I'd like to think they already wanna do it, we just got to give them a good reason to do it and the data on the impact in the business side to back it up. And how could they say no, right? I suspect there's lots of people in the room who have sustainability in their title. And I think it's a really important thing to acknowledge that it's an evolving profession. And I know from some of our conversations that Anne has had really significant experience in changing that conversation from what's this additional cost we need to bear to what's, what's the value of this, what's the benefit. So. And I'm going to throw you under the bus. Hit Anne up afterwards. She's got <laughs> all the wisdom in the world on, on building that case internally. Um, hands up everywhere, but someone's got a microphone, so you win. Thank you very much. My name's Lydia from Future Super. Uh, this question is directed to Anne. Um, you talk a lot about purpose and effective altruism, but how can you reconcile this with the systemic and well-known labor rights abuses that your company's been complicit in over the, the past few years? Thank you. Um, I'll, uh, I'll just decline to answer that one. I'm just here to represent myself today, uh, not Amazon. But I know that a lot of the work that um, you know, we have to do as a company still needs to be done. No company is perfect. And I think you'll see online the things that we already know we have to work on, but a lot of the work to be done is still in formation. I think one thing that Amazon wants to do is to make sure that anything it does, it does at the Amazon level, not just one business and the complexity of millions of employees and all the you know, disparate businesses we have. I think it's about making sure we think about it holistically and bring the armies of funds and people to do it in a way that makes sense. And so I don't represent uh, the internal Amazon sustainability teams. I do try to lend sort of my own experience to help them come up with that next generation ideas. But I think there's been some good progress in some places and still a lot of work to do in other places. So for example, on the environmental side, be being the world's largest corporate purchaser of renewable energy and working a lot of projects, I think that's pretty compelling. But do we have everything figured out across ESG topics that we should be acting on? I'm not convinced either. So a lot of work still to do. And again, welcome any ideas, but you know, these are the points that those that can you know, identify still work to be done, you're often right in terms of the things that we still need to work on. I think the good news is there's literally hundreds, thousands of people trying to figure it out and growing. And so I'm optimistic that things will only get better. We are running out of time and we have an awful lot of hands up in the air, which I very much regret. Um, we've probably got time for one more question and I don't get to choose you. Um, Thank you. Hi, um, Bob here from Greedy for Good, or that's the tagline by Purpose of Profit. So I have a question, how can we help you? Nikki, this year there was activist shareholders who are profit hungry, who've challenged the fiduciary in, in, in Unilever, as an example. So you've talked about partnerships on with the consumer but we have this paradigm of where small businesses are, are purpose-led and they're growing, but then in leadership position that you're all in, you have larger corporates who, even when they want to go purpose-led, are now being challenged, like Unilever is a prime example. So what would you say, each one of you, like how could we shift this momentum that goes towards purpose? Do you want me to start? <laughs> Uh, look, I think at the end of the day, um, we produce, we, we're in the business of everyday brands for everyday people, right? That's what we do. Um, and we will continue to do that with a lens of sustainability. You know, 12 years ago, our 
our CEO at the time, said we're going to double our business and halve our environmental impact and positively improve the lives of the billion people around the world in the most um, required places and we will make a commitment to that. And we had very public statement of intent and KPIs that we've tracked ourselves against as an organisation over that 12-year period. We've made excellent progress in many areas and we've fallen short in others. When our current CEO came in, he doubled down even further and said, we're going to continue to do it, but rather than having a sustainability agenda over here and a business plan over here, we're going to have one integrated plan by which we make all our decisions. We choose the suppliers that we partner with based on whether or not they are able to positively contribute to the commitments that we've made. It's great because most of those suppliers have said either I'm all in or I'm actually doing it better than you guys are so you can learn from us. We've got other suppliers that said I'm all in, I don't know what I don't know but I'm happy to learn and we love working with people like that because we learn together. And there's been other partners that have said we're not interested for a whole host of reasons, many financial, and we've parted ways because it's so much part of the choices that we're making. When it comes to smaller businesses, you know, you asked the question about procurement. You've got to take progress over perfection here. It's really easy to look at companies but forget that there might be a 120-year legacy that you are having to dismantle and rebuild. Many of the businesses in this room today are purpose-led because they started with that intent. We can learn a lot from that because you're reimagining things today and we can take that into our business and scale it fast. So I think we want to give generously where we can. We will steal shamelessly where we can partner with you to take what you have developed and work together to bring the impact that you want to have with scale. We can't partner with everybody, so we also make those choices. But that, if, you, if you can see an opportunity, reach out. Um, I know for sure that the journey that we've been on to date and the success we have had has come as a result of the partnerships that we've also leveraged and the areas of opportunity that we still haven't realised are only going to be realised based on partnerships that we leverage. So I would say um, put your hand up, jump in with us. Uh, but I would encourage everyone to, the more, the more that you can acknowledge the progress that is being made, the more companies will try to jump in as well. Because when you vilify companies, many will hold back until they're 100% ready to do it. And we don't want that. We need people to step in and say, I'm giving it a go, I'm trying. And the most courageous thing you can do is ask for help. Encourage big business, small business, any business to ask for help to get this done faster. That's my tip. Thank you. Really beautiful question to end on. Um, really positive idea of what we can do together. Um, I'm going to wrap it up. I, I wanted to centre this conversation in people and the stories that they bring and the work that they're doing in creating change. I know that there's a few hundred people in this room and every single one of you would have your own stories to add to this conversation. Uh, I really realise that sometimes it's the people in the audience who are doing incredible work as well. So a little bit of gratitude to you for coming along and trying to create change in your everyday. And if there's a little bit of wisdom you can access from these people to help you in that journey, then hopefully um, you will access that in the next couple of days. And lastly, just huge thanks to Sally and the Purpose team. Putting an event on like this is an act of courage in the current environment. So thanks all for coming. Thank you. Thanks for